Hey, look at that. Uh, also, for those of you that maybe missed it, I hope you didn't. We did become the official community of marketingops.com this week. Um, so that was really, really exciting. And I'm super pumped to be doing this session with Cassidy, Max, and MH as our very first session of uh, the community of marketingops.com. Uh, so thank you all for coming and hanging out. Um, just to let you all know what our stats are right now and what we're looking like, this community's grown a lot. Um, we've got over 3,000 members, and a lot of you are pretty senior. Um, so there's a lot to learn from everybody. And, and those who are sort of entering this space, there's a lot of uh, really great talent and experts to lean in on and learn from. So just uh, keep that in mind and engage and uh, invite your friends and invite people who are thinking about, you know, maybe coming into marketing ops. But on to the good stuff. Uh, we've got our three amazing panelists here, Max, Cassidy, and MH. So if we can, uh, let's start with you, Max, and do a quick round of intros. Sure. Uh, I'm Max Morier. Uh, I manage marketing operations, analytics, and uh, growth at Druva. Um, we're about a thousand person company. Uh, and, you know, in terms of my experience on this topic, I've managed several, several teams over the last five or six years. Um, and I'm excited to chat through this with uh, with Cassidy and MH today. And I'm Cassidy. Hi, guys. I work currently as a senior manager of systems and tech at Rev Part, Revolution Parts, and we oversee marketing operations, sales operations, and customer success ops. So we are kind of an ops hub um, is the way we have it set up in our system. So I'm excited to talk to you guys about how we overlap all of those OKRs. And finally, I'm MH, uh, started my career in channel and marketing, and then um, somehow tripped into doing marketing operations. I got to help build the Marketing Operations Center of Excellence at Microsoft Office and IBM Watson Health um, before um, realizing that uh, there was a piece I needed to be able to manage these things better and um, made the less than bright move of leaving marketing ops to do uh startup so uh, good to be here it's a pretty incredible uh startup i have to say so uh we do <laughs> thank we want to thank you mh for helping us host this session stack moxie as a sponsor of the community at large has been tremendous um and for those of you like i know i'm totally shamelessly plugging for them right now but like my mind really was blown two years ago when i first saw the product so uh, yeah and i'll tell a whole story about how it helped with this uh, launch of marketingoffs.com one day but that's for another day. So let's get into OKRs. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and um, we're just gonna have a little conversation about this. Um, you know, Max and, and the crew here, we started uh, just sort of riffing on different questions that we might wanna answer. And, um, you know, this could go a lot of different ways, um, but, you know, Max, if you could maybe start off with, you know, what your thoughts are around the, the idea of measuring sort of quality and, um, the performance of your marketing operations team and how you're sort of working on that at Druva. I think we talked about accountability as a keyword, uh, would love to just sort of kick off with you. Sure. I think, um, you know, depending on your leadership team, I think there are certain expectations of marketing ops and depending on the team you roll into, you know, I've been in situations where I roll into a RevOps org as opposed to a marketing org and the OKRs and the objectives become different depending on your roll up. Um, but in a kind of a traditional marketing setting, uh, and within the marketing operations team, you know, I, I think there's, it's a very different set of goals and OKRs than your, you know, demand gen team or other marketing teams. I almost kind of liken it to the way that a content team or a and yeah, uh, you know, in some cases in the product marketing team reports where, you know, you're not running a campaign by yourself that's responsible for generating pipeline. You're you're a support function. Um and so how how I measure my team is based on how we're supporting the larger marketing motion. So it's largely uh product or project driven. Um, you know, making sure that everyone knows what their project objectives are. And there are certain members of, you know, of my teams that are primarily, you know, traditional ticket execution focused. And so in those cases, it really comes down to, you know, SLA management, obviously there are exceptions to 
basically every project you work on is market apps pricing for SLAs, but, um, you know, sentiment is also a major factor. Like how are your stakeholders, uh, you know, are they feeling supported by your team? So making sure to do a lot of one-on-ones or group setting conversations with, you know, demand gen, web teams, whoever else you happen to be supporting sales teams as well. You know, we're such a key part of the data and off between teams, sales operations, you know, all the teams you interact with, making sure that sentiment is in a good place. If, you know, you may not have that many tickets or you may be crushing SLAs, um, and you may find out that, you know, stakeholders are not having a great experience with your team. So, um, between project goals, uh, there are some volume goals you can set as well around tickets, but, um, sentiment and project execution are really what I, what I look at when I'm measuring my team. I love that you mentioned sentiment because I actively tell my teams, we don't say no to our stakeholders. And that's not that we don't actually say no, like we didn't. <laughs> I was, I was like, wait, but what? <laughs> it's, all about, it's all about position. And so that's like something I actively talk about with my individual holders and especially those people who are, you know, the ad hoc ticket takers and more of just the doers, like their projects may be one a quarter or one every half a year. And so they're really sometimes the thing that like keeps them going when they're in the drudge of just like doing tickets every day. So sentiment, I, I don't use that word, but I tell people, you know, we don't say no to our stakeholders. We learn from our stakeholders. We learn why they're asking us this question. There's always a pain or something going on underneath the ask. And it's our job to understand that. And so we might be able to do that very quickly in one conversation, or we might have to do that over the course of time, just discovering what are they really asking? You know, I feel like stakeholders don't always know exactly what they're asking for, but by just positioning it in my team's head of like, we don't tell people no, we tell them, okay, that doesn't make sense. Or let me understand that a little bit more about why you're asking me for this thing. It does something really great to the sentiment because people learn that our team is not going to just put a wall up and tell them no. And here's the reason why they're always going to do the extra work to discover the real the real question under the question. So I, I love that you touched on that because I feel like we work that into our OKRs and we understand that there's going to be stuff that comes up that we didn't plan for and we got to try to leave some room for it because it's important. I love the OKR framework. I being in like this weird startup community in Seattle, got to meet Vetri Valore who runs Ally. That is like one of the big... OKR tools. Um, and I think it's coming from agile. I had always kind of, um, you know, you always talk about like the bigger goals and what's the project you're working up to in a scaled agile framework was one of the first startups I worked for. Um, and so getting to see this like first OKR framework, I think is a better way to kind of position how you think about your goals. Um, and I feel like we're, being a marketing operation, like the operation center of this marketing organization, it feels like it can be hard to come up with those right high level goals for our organization sometimes, because they're going to be like very marketing, marketing goals. And we have very infrastructure and very systems thinking goals that we have to kind of lift up as well. So I think it's, it is incumbent upon us to set goals for the years that make us more um, scalable or build better processes or, um, you know, clean up tech debt, right? Like in marketing, the marketing world, there is no tech debt, but in marketing technology, marketing operations, tech debt is a real thing and it can slow us to damn near grinding halt, try to get something out the door if we don't deal with it. So lifting up our OKRs to our executives is really critical for us. I'd also say too, like I, I think I misspoke earlier when I said like marketing ops doesn't necessarily, you know, we're, we're not executing on campaigns necessarily, but we do also have, depending on the role within a marketing ops team, a very direct impact on marketing's like dollar contribution to the business. And so like, you know, for folks that 
are either in a kind of a, a more senior marketing ops position as senior manager or something around those, those, you know, those lines or managing someone that's in that role. That's when you do kind of start to, I think, try to draw direct connections from the work, the projects that are being executed and measurable, like, uh, you know, business impact metrics. And I, I think like one example that we went through recently, I have a, a great member of my team, senior manager, and you know, the, the request from the larger business, again, as, as a supporting function was we had seen a direct correlation between like mobile phone number enrichment and meeting and opportunity generation where we're B2B. So that's, you know, a, a key focus for us. And so it wasn't just a matter of, okay, great. We implemented additional mobile phone number enrichment or something. It was like, you have to, you do have to make sure that you understand that what you're doing is for a reason. So making sure that you not only go through the implementation, but track whether it actually had the impact on the business that it did. And it also just gives you a great talking point in your kind of conversations with management and executives to say, look at, it, it's not just that we, you know, implemented a lead life cycle or we implemented a new tool or we input, like what is the impact, but that, that does often happen once you get to the manager up spot, as opposed to, you know, just day to day ticket production, it's a little harder because you're working on so many different projects, um, as more of that support function for individual campaigns. Can we derail the conversation now and um, ask Mike to Max to explain how he did the mobile phone number in Richmond? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I will shout out here today. I may just stack my two. So, uh, oh, last day. Particular tool. We don't have a phone number in Richmond. <laughs> I know. I know. So we there there were a couple of technologies that we that we explored, and basically we we knew that we. Uh, our, our sales ops team, um, still wanted us to kind of lead with zoom info, uh, which is our normal enrichment platform for accounts and, and leads. But, um, we were finding that it was not doing a great job of, of providing mobile phones. So we went out and found a supplemental technology that is you know, waited until after that webhook ran and, uh, you know, looked for gaps in that enrichment before then calling out to our secondary kind of enrichment option, which has done a great job of mobile phone enrichment. So if anyone's interested in hit me up separately, but we're, you know, we're at about 50% mobile phone enrichment rate right now, which is for us fantastic. So happy yeah. to show I know why I get called from Druva all the time. <laughs> I don't know if you are. I don't think I am. <laughs> no. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some examples of, um, uh, actual OKRs. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, these were pulled through from an actual conversation in our Slack channel, uh, just a couple weeks ago, which was actually kind of the inspiration of this whole thing. Um, I know Cassidy, you could speak to these pretty clearly because I think you were the one that posted the majority of these. Um, and so let's, let's just talk through some of the, uh, different objectives that you have here. I like that they're laid out in three different objectives. Um, and maybe like talk us through some of these and Max, I think you have some really specific OKRs too. So we'll jump into yours. Yeah, this is definitely coming from a more of a startup space perspective where you're oftentimes the, you are the manager director and you're also the individual contributor in there doing the things. So, um, I've worn that hat for a long time and it always felt right to me to not only have the metric based KPIs that you have an objective one there which are all the things that like your stakeholders, your C-suite, your board, anybody um, above you really cares about, right? But then also to have the pieces that really make like ops fun. And in my opinion, which is the innovation side of it. So like the way I think about it is oftentimes in the metric base or in measuring KPIs and, and just ensuring we have all of that stuff in place and automated successfully, you find and you uncover a lot of things, right? Like things that maybe aren't optimal for the way that you do business or like things that were built for C to B instead of B to B. And you just start to uncover those things. So we always make a ticket. We make tickets for everything. Everything goes into a backlog and we pull from that backlog to say like, okay, what are we passionate about? What What's something that we found that we really want to go fix that we think will have an impact? And I let my, my, um, 
team come to me and tell me what they're passionate about. Like I don't assign their innovation base objective to them. It's something that they go pick out. They build a case. They do the research to understand what the impact will be to the business. And then we decide together if it's something worth doing. So for me, the the objective too is really important because it gives my team the autonomy to choose what they're going to work on. And of course, it's aligned with the business needs and it's aligned with what um, we need to accomplish as a company, but it also gives them just fun, something fun to work on. Um, and then of course you have objective three, which is your operational excellence. I feel like this is the one that gets forgotten sometimes. Um, or if you get too busy or you have really big audacious goals one quarter, these are kind of the things that will fall by the wayside. And so I feel it's also important just to make sure we're not skipping those things. So you have your data integrity, your tech debt, which MH talked about. Um, a lot of the cross-departmental stuff, the little integrations that get configured and set up and kind of forgot about, if you will. I don't want to say that because nobody does that, right? We all remember it. <laughs> every piece of technology. Is that oh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's the point of objective three is kind of all of those things that seem to fall by the wayside that maybe they're not important to your boss or your boss's boss, but they're things that need to happen and be maintained in order for us to, to remain successful. Max thoughts. I know you had some uh, some some stuff in here, and it was funny when we were talking earlier this week. It was very different goals based on the type and size of business you were in. Yeah, I think you know it definitely varies, um, and it, again, it varies by like team member within a marketing ops role as well, um, and kind of the scope of that role. Um, I think a lot of what I focus on, kind of. The other non-marketing ops specific parts of my roles are some of those same metrics, specifically like conversion metrics through the funnel. Um, and you know what what I do try and get my more kind of technical team members to focus on and set goals around are ways that we as a marketing ops team can proactively improve those. So like you had, you know, MQL conversion on there. And and you know, we've, you know, if folks are using the traditional funnel. MQL to SQL, whatever your definition of SQL might be, SQL to op, and then op to certain stages or to bookings. Like those are critical parts of a lot of B2B funnels. And, um, you know, there's a lot that we can do to improve that, especially, um, especially when it comes to, you know, data quality. And I saw a question in the, in the Q and A about, uh, t technology onboarding and that impact on, uh, you know, customer acquisition costs. And, and kind of other actual core business metrics outside of kind of the immediate metric. And I think that, um, yeah, there, you, you can directly, you should be able to directly tie to that. I mean, if you're, if you're implementing some sort of new technology or platform, you're trying to solve some sort of problem. Um, so what, how does that problem tie to the business? And then if you do a pre post or you have some sort of hypothesis, then, then you can show before and after how this particular part of the funnel that you're affecting adds value to later parts of the funnel. And by doing, by solving this problem, you improve this issue. Um, so I think you, you absolutely can tie technology implementation to actual real business value, as long as you know what value, what problem you're trying to solve. Um, so yeah, I, th I thought this was a great question. Um, but also, you know, Again, I'll start with the, uh, with the stack moxie evangelization again, but, um, you know, we do use stack moxie for our, uh, for, for our own kind of team, uh, okay. Our tracking as well. We, we, you know, we've built several, uh, monitoring and, and testing, uh, flows in stack moxie and each of my team members is responsible for, uh, keeping tabs on a certain subset of those and keeping our processes uh, above a certain threshold of success and fail and responsible for going in and solving problems as they go. So we do use kind of obviously a combination of project goals, depending on the role, uh, the sentiment that I mentioned earlier, as well as platforms like Stack. Well, there is no platform like Stack Moxie. Stack Moxie oh, specifically, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to keep tabs on our, the success of our automation, um, that our teams are responsible for. I think like, you know, I don't, 
look, this was, this is a, a sponsored session by Stack Moxie. We get that. And this wasn't spent, meant to be a total love fest, but I do think that it is, um, it is important to think about the, I think uh, the objective three column here, the operational excellence stuff, like it's really hard to do, uh, this, this sort of like validation of, well, did the lead get where it's supposed to go? Like, did those rules that we worked so hard on aligning our sales and marketing team actually get fulfilled the way we expected? Like, that was the part that I sort of like shamelessly plugged earlier, like two years ago, I was like, oh my God, okay, this makes a lot of sense. So it sounds like Max, you're using Stack Moxie's like uh, interface for that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, like, I think the one of the most straightforward examples, because uh, we have it applied on several critical pieces of automation and web form testing, but, um, you know, like our lead lifecycle obviously is, is a critical element of this marketing sales handoff, um, the marketing funnel. And we want to make sure if someone reaches a certain threshold or um, reaches a threshold that doesn't have you know, the information necessary for ourselves to actually follow up that we aren't wasting people's time or that we're not wasting an opportunity uh, that should be surfaced to our, our sellers um, and isn't for some operational reason. So, you know, if we aren't sending people to our sales team that should be surfaced, we're missing out on actual dollars for our business. And Stack Moxie gives us a clean visual of Oh, this person should have been passed over, but was not. And also tells us what particular criteria it failed on so that we can go track down. Okay. It was checking this field, this field, this field, this field, it should have been passed over, but it wasn't because of this. So we can like very quickly go try and track that lead down, figure out what caused the fail, plug that gap and also correct it for that, that record. I think there's other KPIs, by the way, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, but I think there's, there's other KPIs in that operational excellence too, that are, um, like when we were doing office, we used power BI to look at field usage, right? So we have, you know, every field should have lead source, but they don't, right? So how do you go in and, and make sure you have 97%, uh, of your lead records have a value in lead source, um, which our tool doesn't do, by the way. Uh, I actually think, uh, Sonar has just uh launched that feature um i'm big yeah. <laughs> we we also use um like power bi is good we would do a sample test so export three percent of your lead volume in a random sample and you can i mean for Mercado, you can create random samples pretty easily um create a random sample export three of them three percent of them and then manually look at them every now and then so those are other ways you can kind of track data quality or operational excellence um if you don't have tools um, or if you can't afford tools right like tools cost money so i mean not ours ours is free but if if there are <laughs> if you can't afford them um you know, being able to do those things with Google Sheets and Excel, it's incredible the amount of data analysis you can do there. Um, and my being an absolute nerd, that's what I enjoy doing on Friday night. <laughs> yeah, I think it works. I wasn't Stack Moxie enlightened before this week. So really? we, we have a dashboard actually that just looks at, uh, there's like five things in each department. So uh, OKR, or excuse me, um, MQLs is one of them. It's like, if an MQL comes into the system and it's created date is this week, but it doesn't have an MQL date and it came from Pardot, like it shows up on my Salesforce dashboard, I get a notification. So yeah, there's ways to put fail safes in place so that you kind of always know where you're standing. But I feel like when it comes to measuring an OKR, I typically, like I tell my team, just, just pull a report. It's less important that you're 100% accurate. Like, I don't need to know, okay, I affected MQL by 0.723% over all of the customers. Like, it's not important that we get to that very exact number. What's really important to me is that we're measuring a baseline at the beginning before you start your project. And we use that very same baseline at the end of you completing your project. And even if our numbers are a little off, I can trust that that impact was from this time to this time. And if the only thing that we've changed is what you've implemented, then I can kind of deduce that that this was you're directionally correct, even if they're not exactly correct. 
Yeah. I think the other one um, that I love from an OKR perspective is looking at um, how much are you trying to innovate? So if if we're spending 20% of our projects are on existing things, I think this is a Gil from Metadata quote. Um, he talks about you always need to go through and it's not just we're going to A-B test our messaging. Like we're going to spend 20% of our dollars or we're going to spend 20% of um, our marketing operations team doing something completely different. We're going to try Facebook ads. We're going to try an uh, in-person event. We're going to try hitting a totally new persona. So I, I think having some specific metric, whether, you know, if you're really looking at the backlog of your team and what you're prioritizing, then all of a sudden you can go through and say, we want to prioritize 20% of our time on innovation. Uh, yeah, and I think this this question right here from Diver, Deeper, I apologize if I butchered your name. I'm so sorry. Uh, can, the question is, can you please provide some examples of metrics KPIs for innovation based objectives? And like, I think you're starting to touch on that a little bit, just setting aside the intentionality of like, uh, you know, a certain percentage of your team's time or budget is focused on innovation, but Cassidy or, or Max, if anybody has any other examples, um, I think those would be helpful here too. I mean, I think like innovation. I think the, especially when you talk to executives, their, you know, their definition of innovation is like literally inventing an entirely new concept. And that's just not what it is. It's, it's, it's doing something new within the context of your company that, you know, hasn't been done before to, again, solve some sort of problem. And like, if it's, if it's the demand generation team or growth team or whoever, you know, working on a new tactic or program, uh, that's, that's them, you know, for us, we're, we're really focused on, you know, uh, system data quality handoff, you know, all of the, the operational components. And so, you know, like one example for us, it's not innovative in the sense of like the entire industry, but at our company, we, we didn't have a, you know, a, um, form shortening solution essentially. Right. So we're, we're a very, you know, we don't have like a self-serve free trial or anything like that. So we're very sales, we are we're very sales centric. So we require a lot of information in order to feed our routing structure, which is terrifying if you look at our lean data, but, <laughs> um, you know, so we need, we're a classic example of needing a whole bunch of fields and our executives, you know, really hate that, but it's, it's necessary. Um, and, you know, enrichment is only going to solution for a certain portion of that. If we only ask for a, a few smaller number of fields. So, you know, it, it's not, it's, it's not new to us in the industry, but it was new to our company to go out and purchase and implement a form shortening solution applied across all of our, you know, map and website forms. Um, and again, pre and post, like how did this affect conversion? We know that engagement with our content adds X amount of, you know, people to our system and that X amount of that engagement and that people will end up as an engaged, you know, lead and MQL ends up as an opportunity ends up as a booking. And so you can calculate out based on that pre and post, how much potential value that technology adds. And that was for us an innovation at our company, even though it's something that's pretty standard in a lot of places. So opportunities like that are, are a good way to, to innovate. Yeah, we use kind of the same principle, Max, where it's not something that's brand new. It's typically just something that either is not broken enough in our business that we have needed to go tackle it, or we kind of have something in place that's maybe painful, but it's working, right? So a good example, um, like our SDRs didn't have a cadencing tool, but they had templates. They knew what they were using. They had a document that told them the order of operations. So I have a, a rep next quarter that wants to implement a cadency tool. So it's typically something that's like needed, I would say, but we don't have the budget. We don't have the time. There's other more big problems that can, can be tackled. And that's why we try to make it just a percentage of what we do. But there's definitely, I, I think, a lens that you look through it, which is like something that's working or doesn't necessarily need to be fixed, but maybe is painful. Like 
uh, demo notes is a great example. We had the hardest time getting our AEs to put whole demo notes on the opportunity. And like, we were like, all right, what's a way that we could innovate on this? Because telling them to do it is not going to get them to do it anymore. But we gave them a, a custom action button where they, you know, click a button, they get a screen pop up, it asks them certain questions. They're like excited. We put some confetti at the end. It literally is just something so silly that it made all of the difference in getting the opportunities fully enriched before close. So like, yeah, to us, that's an innovation because we didn't, we definitely didn't need it. I didn't need to figure out how to put confetti on. on I, I, I'm like, my mind is like, really like, I'm like how I need to see, I feel like you need to do a little screen recording of a completed uh, enrichment just so we can all see it and we'll put, we'll add <laughs> I'm mad. I think the other way you could look at it is if you are using a visible or if you're looking at your funnel metrics, right? Just doing benchmarking, Mike. I know you've got benchmarking across marketing ops, but like, mm -hmm. you know, just asking a question about does this feel like should we have a 70% conversion here or does four months feel like the right time? Looking at some of those metrics and when your metrics are out of whack, your OKR could be to impact this metric. And that's your innovation metric. It doesn't have to necessarily be, you know what you're gonna do to solve it. Bringing those problems to your team um, as an objective, I think are really exciting ways to get um, best ideas to the table. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And I think um, a lot of this, what I hear, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think about like managers coming on up, thinking about how do you ask these questions? How do you even know what to think about, and then how do you manage it all the way through? And I think, you know, Jeff asked a good question um, in the Q&A tab here around um, any type of like project management. Like I hear a lot of project management coming in. You know, you were saying, Max, as you were talking about, you know, mm. establishing like the goal and then going back and looking at it, like even when, especially when it comes to innovation, right? Like there has to be sort of a start and journey that you go through. And, and Jeff's yeah. question is sort of about like, should people be pursuing certifications around pragmatic, you know, uh, practices or PMI or anything like that? Yeah, I, I would, I'm always, um, cautious of certifications. Like I think there, there's nothing wrong with getting a certification. I think, you know, myself personally, Marketo certification has been something I've maintained over the years, but it is not the reason why you know, I get my job done. Um, I would say that oh, most marketing ops people turn into project managers by default, uh, having the shepherd technology and, you know, automation end to end, um, and explain why and explain what happens and the impact at the end. Um, so I, I think if there are project management certifications out there, I know there are like classes as well. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think it's necessary um, to to be a good project manager. It's helpful to have a framework, I think. But um, so if that helps provide a framework, um, I think that's a good thing. Uh, but I don't know if it's if it's necessary. I'd also say too on, you know, in terms of either being a people manager or an IC with a manager, um, it's also not just incumbent on you by yourself to create. OKRs, like you, you should talk to your manager. Um, and if you're a manager, you should talk to your team members about OKRs. Uh, like, you know, if you're, if you're managing a group of five or six people, you should know what you should be helping them create their OKRs, not just expecting them to come up with great OKRs on their own. They are going to need help figuring out and making that connection to the business and you as manager have a better vantage point on, you know, for what impact needs to happen and where your team can kind of provide the most impact. So, um, don't feel like you have to create your OKR by yourself in a vacuum and figure all this out on your own. You should be working with your manager or your team members across your org to figure out what you can impact. I love that call out. I do too. I feel like it's a manager's responsibility, right? To like share with you how you're going to impact those big things and help them connect the dots with like what I'm doing and how it makes that impact. Because the quarter's a long time when you're in the trenches 
you know, implementing something. And it's really easy to lose that, that vision and understand why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it was like the last two weeks of the quarter for me. Like I'd be coming flying in and going, oh, crap, I forgot about that one. And then I'd have like a long weekend getting that one OKR out the door. Key result. When it comes to certs and, and my team, just to touch back on that, Max, like I encourage my my junior, even just people who reach out like for mentorship, like if you're going into a new role, you've never touched anything project management related. It's probably worthwhile for you to go get that cert. But if you've been living in a project management like role, like your entire career, and you just don't have the certification, like save your money and just go find a YouTube video with the framework and, you know, see what you're missing, find the skills that you're missing. But yeah, I've, I've had Marketo, Salesforce, all that stuff certified. And it's never been the winning factor in why I, I get something done. So I'm from the deep South and in the deep South, we have social norms that are very, very like ingrained in us. So like you wear a shin length dress to a tea party, right? Like there are these social norms. I find that those certifications or frameworks can be kind of that social norm definition. They can be your, your common vernacular. So like you all show up to the party and you know what to wear, right? Like if if you're an agile and we're doing scrum, we know it's a stand up. It's not that it's important. It's the right way. It's just a social norm that makes everyone feel comfortable as they show up to the party. Greatly important. I think, I think this is a nice segue too, to start thinking about some of the thought leadership content that I, that we're going to share right now, which is the strategic quality model that Stackbox is um, starting to formulate. And I think, you know, MH from our discussion, this is still, uh, an evolving set of, of, um, ideas, but maybe if you could just talk us through a little bit around the journey of thinking about managing sort of technology, um, in a, in a quality manner, I really like the way that that you were sort of positioning that to me the other day um, and maybe just sort of talk us through this, this document. And again, everybody, this, uh, this will be available afterwards. Um, I think it's also available currently in the docs tab. <laughs> yeah. And I just did a talk on this uh, for the pager duty conference as well, where I spent a lot of time on communication and error maturity. Um, so I can share that link if anyone wants it too. Um, but I think it's, when we're thinking about OKRs, it's a lot easier. We've just been talking about frameworks, right? It's a lot easier just to have a framework to say, I want to get slightly better at this thing next year. What does that even freaking mean? Um, and so that's a lot of what I was trying to put on paper. Um, this, this kind of the way the model looks was borrowed from a serious decisions, marketing operations, maturity model, which just informed my thinking when we were starting to build things at office, like getting my head around it. Um, so very little of this is actually something Stack Moxie can help with. A lot of this is just stuff your team has to get good at on their own. Uh, but I, I think there are things as a marketing operations team, if we had key objectives around being transparent about good communication, um, Max talking about sentiment, um, about uh, being really good when there's an error and how do we deal with it and how are we prescriptive about that in advance and executing against our prescribed approach. Um, monitoring and testing, I clearly have a passion for, <laughs> um, for obvious reasons, but, you know, just agreeing that we're going to monitor things um, or agreeing what it looks like to launch a new campaign um, is super helpful. It is in, definitely will make everyone's lives a little bit easier. And then finally, you know, we've talked a lot about capacity management. So, you know, what's your work backlog or what's your process for taking on new projects? Um, as Cassidy said, never say no, or as I say, always say no. Uh, uh, so I, I think each of these, and, and they don't apply to everyone, right? Maybe some people don't need a bug tracking list that, um, is aggregate across their company. Their company doesn't think that way. Like if you were a marketing agency, it's probably not a good fit. Um, but you might need just a bug tracking list for your company. And once you've gotten good at having that bug tracking list, then having a ticketing system where you can track when something is created um, and how long it takes you to act against it. And then once you know those details, then you can start to commit to how long it should take you to respond when a bug is created or when a ticket is created. 
so that people can have more and more predictive um, expectations of how they work with you. And at the end, that quality just builds trust. It's just going to let your organization, I think, if I had to say there was one unifying quality between all of us in marketing operations, it's that we just want to be left alone to do a really good job and get all the stuff done. So at the end of the day, if you can be super transparent and communicate really well and handle your stuff, people will leave you alone to do a really great job. I know we're short on time. Was that deep enough, Mike? Or yeah, no. I mean, we're we're doing we're doing fine. We got about sixteen minutes or so left. Um, and I I do want to leave time for more of these questions that are coming in from folks. Um, so I, I think so. Yeah. I, I just I, go ahead. I would just say like sometimes we have in marketing ops um, a hard time uh, explaining why we need to create process. Like some of this is friction. Like, you know, creating, if you don't have SLAs, create them first off, but like explaining why you're starting to push back and create additional timeline and, you know, friction can be, it's, it's necessary in certain places. And if you're having a hard time kind of explaining that to, you know, it's going to be hard explaining it to the immediate stakeholder, but when it comes down to like, you guys are fighting about SLAs and you have to bring in your you know, your manager or your executive <clears throat> and explain why, um, the, the, what I've found most effective is just talking about scalability. Like I, everything I bring, like if this, you know, stack Moxie as an example, like, why should I buy this tool? Well, do we want to scale? Like, because if, if, if we want to scale, we need to make sure stuff's not breaking. We need to make sure that, you know, uh, capacity is managed across all the teams that we're not doing too much to the point that it doesn't work because no one's doing a good job because they're overloaded. Like scale is a really effective, um, talking point with executives when it comes to why you need to add process or why you need to add tools to help with process. Yep. That resonates greatly with me. I think I personally had said those keywords many a time to managers in my past about, you know, building for scale versus trying to just get something done. Um, you know, we do that. We band-aid things in marketing ops all the time that need a quick fix. And if you don't have some sort of system to maybe be, put that in a backlog or a tracker or some sort of, you know, project management solution to come back to that and then maybe refactor and go build for scale, like it's okay to do the one-off band-aid fix thing, but you know, we always want to build for skills. So, um, yeah, and refactoring the code thing is, yeah. I feel like we're at the point where we need to refactor Mark and Winston's badly. Um, you know, like it, it, it's just something that I don't think hits our backlog the way it should as tech professionals. Uh, I would agree. I think refactoring feels like a burden most of the time that nobody wants to deal with. I think, you know, Cassidy, you were saying earlier, like, some of the reason things may or may not be happening is that it's just not painful enough, <laughs> which is such a shame. <laughs> like, oh, you have to wait till somebody screams like really loud to go take a tackle it or something. And, you know, I think frameworks like this, um, thinking about positioning for scale, thinking about, um, measuring quality across your stack and, and OKRs in general can maybe help you advocate for something that, you know, is actually really painful that nobody screams loud enough about. Um, but I think it's a shame that we have to wait for somebody to like, you know, say it's, oh, this is now really painful. So I have to fix it. <laughs> um, Band-Aid fixes can't, I was just gonna say, sometimes Band-Aid fixes can't be, um, they can't be avoided. Like you just need it. You just have to go do the thing. So a uh, nice tactic I thought I'd share is I have, I have negotiated with my executives, like I'll do your band-aid fix. I will go implement this thing, but I need you to give me five hours in my next sprint to fix everything that I'm going to break by doing this or to, to go and at least optimize it to a scalable level or, or get it to a point where it's, I can leave it alone and not worry how it's going to break things down the road. So I think it's just, too. That's part of uh, MH's communication there, right? Is just making sure that if you need to do something and you know it's going to it's gonna cause more problems and not like communicate. And if you don't feel comfortable, get your manager to communicate. Like, But just letting somebody know like, hey, here's why I'm not comfortable doing this thing. 
and what it's going to cause. I feel like that's half the battle right there. A lot of times the problem is not that you're doing the Band-Aid fix. It's that you're doing the Band-Aid fix and somebody somewhere knows this is not the way we should be doing things and they're not they're not uh, voicing it. So, yeah, I uh, it, it's always that. Oh, shoot. Those leads. We need to fix lean data, right? Like there's some tree that's broken lean data. So we're going to go into Marketo and we're going to create a direct. It's going to sync the lead direct over to one salesperson. And I need to make sure I don't forget and leave this because that dude's going to leave in six months and it's going to be how. I think every single Marketo instance older than two years old has like a direct sync to one sales guy buried in some but operational campaign somewhere. We'll literally just fix this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. All right. So uh, we got about coming up on 10 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into a few of these questions that are coming up. Jomar. Uh, hey, Jomar. Good to see you here. Um, asked a great question around if you had one automation monitoring play and you could only do one, what would it be and why? I'm curious, like how you interpret this question. Who's going to jump in first? <laughs> I would say it's completely dependent on your organization and what, like <clears throat> when we were implementing Stack Moxie and trying to decide where we wanted to start, it had some prior experience with it and kind of knew what might have the most impact. But, um, you know, it's looking at what parts of your automation and your flow of data between, you know, website marketing sales is the most critical and would have the most impact if it broke that's that's where i start so we we started in two places we started in one on the website um it wasn't it, it's it you know one of the great things about stack moxie is i can also just do form testing on your site you can test more than just forms on your site but you know we know that a critical part of our business is um you know folks that are raising their hand for uh, an assisted trial or requesting a demo that the critical component of, of what, what adds value. So we set up testing to make sure that, uh, you know, multiple times a day, Stackbox would go in, test those forms, make sure they're not broken. And if it is, it notifies us before, you know, God forbid our CEO happens to go on the site and realize one of our forms is down and start screaming. So oh, well, I got that. that's <laughs> one. <laughs> it's uh, and then, you know, the other. The other is that, you know, lead life cycle for us, because that handoff point from, you know, marketing engaged, marketing qualified, servicing that to our SDRs is, uh, is, you know, that critical, that critical breakdown that does sometimes happen depending on the information that we do or don't have on a record, but it depends on, you know, what's going to create the most havoc. I think if it goes down, that's, that's, that's a good starting point. Mm -hmm. I always think of it as what he said and. Um, so what's, what's the biggest volume point, right? Like, so that's generally the most havoc. What's your most time sensitive? So I worked with a company once and if their leads got older than two hours long, they were useless. So if you have something that's that time sensitive, like it, it's critical that you understand within that time frame what's broken. And so you're not just, you know, all of a sudden those are always dead. Um, the third one is um where are you spending the most money so if you're spending a million dollars a day pointing a bunch of people to, people to a landing page that's got then you know complicated lead routing i would make sure that the landing page is up and the lead routing's working and then the last one um is what max said as well like your boss what really pisses them off so just and it might be stupid and it might not actually matter to your business, but it really matters to your job if your CEO is pissed at you because something stupid that they have a personal baggage on breaks. CEOs never have personal baggage in case anyone was curious. <laughs> That's so funny. Cassidy, any thoughts or you feel, feel I good think that one. they hit the <laughs> okay, cool. We'll go ahead and uh, move on to this to this next question here. Um, Sharing Harrison, what tools or methods have you found are best for keeping your stakeholders informed on your OKRs or KPIs that people outside of the marketing org actually use and trust? 
I have to agree. Sometimes it does feel like dashboards uh, feel a little flashy and then you end up with some, you know, requests for ad hoc reports. So definitely curious to hear your thoughts on this. I will chime in here and say that OKRs should be adopted and spoke about at the company and executive level, at, like often. And so I think for me, like dashboards, they do tend to kind of fall off, but I think whatever tool that you build initially, and if it's a dashboard, it's just important to keep using that tool and continue. Like with us, we discuss OKRs once a month amongst our team. And then I discuss OKRs um, quarterly with my leader, if not a little bit more, but we're bringing up our dashboard every single month and every time we have that conversation. And I do that as a way to make sure that the flashy appeal doesn't fall off. Right. And that they're seeing, okay, well, I'm going to go ask Cassidy, Hey, where, what's, where are we at on this number? Where are we at this metric? I'm going to send them the dashboard and say, this is where I find this information. And it's, it should be something that's already shared with them. So I think the answer to your question sort of twofold, like one of them is practice and behavior, right? Like getting all of your executives to buy into OKRs, which they totally should because it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing to do to keep your business moving in the right direction. And so like that's one side of it. And then you'll, you'll kind of get the adoption that you're looking for. And then I think the other side um, is dashboards are great. There are tools out there, like there's um, ETW, there's uh Office Vibe, there's a couple of tools out there that are pretty low cost that you can put your OKRs into and receive like automated notifications. So it just sort of depends on if you have the budget for one of those tools. I mean, I love me some good old fashioned PowerPoint, right? <laughs> like, but it, it, it takes everyone um, starting meetings with them, coming back to them. I think it's, I think it's process is, is the only thing that matters, um, not the toolkit in my perspective. I mean, I, I really like, um, Allies product. I think there's some other good OKR products as well, and it helps to cascade it down and it helps you to see, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of some of the dumb stuff I've asked the organization to do that if we had cascaded them down in a tool, I'd realize I was the only one talking about it. No one else had it, their goals. <laughs> So it's like the tree that has no roots is, is the one, one of the three goals, like no one's supporting that goal, everyone's supporting the other two. So I think those tools can be really helpful in visualizing who's supporting those, those super senior organizational goals. Cool. Max, good? <laughs> I think they covered it. Like the communication, just as much as the tools is... Yeah is critical having regular conversations with your management as well as your stakeholders making sure they are aware of what's on everyone's plate what the timelines are um as well as internal knowing the impact yeah yeah um so some some things that i was just thinking about as i was tuning in to all of you here and i was thinking you know you, you touched on some interesting data points that sort of from those nuggets of data, um, OKRs were derived. Um, I think MH, you specifically called out, Hey, I worked on an organization who said, uh, if the leads were two hours <laughs> old, they were useless. Um, I think Max, you called out something sort of similar. Oh, we found that the enrichment of mobile phone number or just mobile phone numbers was, uh, tied to success rates of close or something like that. Um. I'm curious just to hear, maybe Max, we can start with you or yeah, we'll start with you. Um, and Cassidy, if you have anything that sort of ties into this, how did you get to that part? Like, how did that even come up? Did yeah. you ask the question? Did someone in leadership yeah. ask the question or did somebody just go, Hey, I really want to dig into the correlation of data here. Yeah. It, so for, for us, um, because I own marketing analytics. Honestly, I spend at least as much time on that as marketing operations because I've got great, I've gotten more of a you know team resource situation on marketing ops like that. I've got a lot more people that can focus on that than on the marketing analytics side. So I spend a lot of time personally in marketing analytics, and it gives me a really great view of where those breakdowns are. Um, and we, I work really closely with, um, you know, we have a business intelligence team, you know, that 
typically focuses a little more on, you know, sales, uh, analytics and, and, uh, finance analytics and things like that. But that's a, an excellent starting point for me to understand pain points. And then my job is to figure out marketing's, you know, chunk of that and where we might be missing or, or, you know, supporting well. And so that is just by the nature of my role, a great starting point. And also just feedback, like hearing what people are talking about it you know, QBRs or monthly business reports and things like that, like hearing what the seller's pay points are or marketing pay points are, is a good, you know, the, the mobile phone thing came from our sellers. They were like, we've noticed that our connect rates are way better with mobile phones and we get way more meetings. It's like, obviously that makes sense, but we weren't really thinking about that. So that was our, our entry point for that. Mm. But we did go prove it out first. We did want to make sure, mm. like <laughs> we took that feedback and we were like, okay, Let's go check. And so that's where we went then and pulled in, you know, that connect rate information with or without a mobile. And we had to validate first, but that's where it started. Interesting. Uh, MH, what about the two hour thing? Was that just something that was inherent knowledge that you stepped into or did somebody start trying to poke around? Um, did somebody have kind of a role like Max where they were just poking around looking for holes? To, to... Oh yeah, it was a sales analytics person. No, no, no. What was crazy though is that there were times that the system latency, like literally the time it took for someone to fill out a form on a partner site, by the time it made it to the salesperson was longer than two hours. So just the system um, would get, it it was really on third-party websites when someone would fill out a request on like, you know, G2, or it wasn't G2, but I'm trying to think of the system. And they'd fill out a form there that, and so you'd have to, and the only way to know, because they'd say, oh, the lead was created in Marketo at 10.02 and it made it to Salesforce at 10.04. Well, you'd have to, if you filled out the form on that website, it was submitted the day before. It was right. actually at night. And so it was like, it was fine between our systems, just getting to us was horrible. Yeah. It was literally someone sitting on the form yeah. with a stopwatch. Really, oh, I think it wow. was. That's wild. Um, So this has been great. Um, Thank you all for joining. Um, As I I mentioned earlier, just in the chat, if you didn't get a chance to see it, we will share this recording. Uh, I will share the sort of slides as well um, and the link to the strategic quality model. Um, The three of you, thank you very much for sharing your insights. I hope this has been helpful for all of you. You asked some incredible questions. Connor, I apologize for not being able to get to yours, but let's sync up in the community. Um, And everybody... You guys all have a wonderful, what t- what is today? It's almost Friday, folks. So have a good, good rest of your week. Yeah. <laughs>